Please welcome to the stage, Jonathan Williams. I was at this party last summer, sitting at a picnic table, innocently. Um, I guess I was drinking, so maybe it wasn't that innocent, but I was just minding my own business, and I noticed this woman staring at me. And uh, I did that thing where you kind of look away, look back sheepishly, and finally she asked me, are you that loser guy? <laughs> and in my head I'm like, oh my god, am I the loser guy? <laughs> then I realized she was talking about Failure Lab, and I had to tell someone, yes, yes, I'm the loser guy. <laughs> It is a strange thing to be so closely tied to failure because, frankly, failure is weird. And as much as everyone talks about bouncing back and learning from struggle, nobody, no one, wants to be branded a failure. We've spent the last four years pushing back on the stigma through storytelling events and curriculum, and I've got to say we're still figuring it out. The definition is something about not meeting expectations, but if that's true, that's like every day of our lives. That is legit every single one of my Mondays. <laughs> I had pause for laughter, so I'm glad that worked out. <laughs> <laughs> While failure may seem like a counterintuitive thing to focus on, it's actually becoming really relevant in our world of constant change. We are in the midst of wild and exponential growth. Everything's speeding up, and it's kind of like nobody knows where we're going. And our brains were not designed to evolve fast enough to this pace, and I think a lot of people are becoming isolated and afraid. The consequence of constant change is that, whether we like it or not, we're all forced to try new things. So inevitably, all of us, whether we like it or not, are going to fail more. So suddenly, how we respond to failure is a pretty important question, and it's not just how we respond, it's how do our bosses, our coworkers, our friends, our families, I'm so glad the slides are working. This is really good. <laughs> I like to say that I'm a serial entrepreneur, which is really just a polite way of saying that I'm a college dropout. <laughs> my, my entire career has been in this swirling storm of ideas and people, and I've actually come to find that there's a lot to be learned in that storm. Organizing, implementing, failing, succeeding, fighting, fighting, fighting a little bit more, uh, regrouping, and then trying again. All of these things have been true of Failure Lab, and today I just want to talk a little bit about the history of the idea, how our events work, and what we're doing with curriculum. At its core, Failure Lab is an event that showcases the untold failures behind success. It's the context, the backstory. Initially, it was just an experiment between friends, and now it's growing around the world. We give a stage to successful people, and we let them open up about their struggles. We featured celebrities, athletes, musicians, CEOs, writers, rappers, lawyers, doctors. Our goal is to push back on the fear and the isolation and the stigma around failure, as well as encourage people to keep trying new things. So where did this come from? About five years ago, a friend of mine, Jordan O'Neill, attended TEDx Detroit and heard a powerful talk. An older man launched into a very personal story about how he had moved to America, a wealthy businessman. He then proceeded to lose his new business, his fortune, his health, his wife left him, and lastly, his daughter committed suicide. This man spoke so openly and honestly, it was shocking, yet refreshing. He then, at the very end, kind of tied it up and spoke about how he hit bottom and moved to Detroit and found a new purpose in the community there. The entire drive back to Grand Rapids, my friend couldn't stop thinking about that one talk. He kept asking himself, what if we did that? What if we had an event with no success, no accomplishments? What would that even feel like? Over about six months of conversations and what we like to call porch bourbons, which is really just dudes drinking on porches, <laughs> we uh, eventually formed our idea. We designed an intimate evening featuring storytellers blended with musicians. Each storyteller comes on a stripped-down stage and shares a personal failure. Our special ingredient and what makes it so different and what we've yet to find anyone else doing in the world is that our speakers cannot share lessons. They cannot justify or blame shift. 
They cannot share what they're doing now. They can only own or take responsibility for their actions. We then invite the audience into the story by asking for their lessons. So immediately following each talk is a moment of silence for people to share their thoughts on Twitter. This simple act of not justifying allows for something special in us as listeners. We internalize the story. We relate. We take a moment to own our own failures. And the cool thing about not telling people what to think is that you actually get to hear what they're thinking. And we've had thousands of different and beautiful and introspective thoughts to the same story. Before our first event, I cannot tell you how horrified I was. We, we had never even done an event before, and uh, we'd never been to one like this. And uh, you know how these headlines are going to go if this thing goes sideways. Yeah, some of you are tracking the failed failure lab. We are constantly trying to outrun that bad joke, but that's the whole point of what we're trying to do. In order for us to try new things, we can't be afraid of screwing it up. I called the lead singer of the Verve Pipe, Brian Vander Ark, our headliner. I don't know if you remember that song, The Freshman. For the life of me. I should stop that right there. <laughs> oh, mayonnaise. Uh, Brian kept asking if being the headliner meant he was the biggest failure. <laughs> to his face, I always said no. <laughs> Brian shared the incredible backstory behind his rise and fall, knocking you two off the number one spot on the global charts, touring the world, performing in amazing sold out venues, then getting canceled from Saturday Night Live at the last minute because their second album completely bombed. He talked about the pressure, the constant pressure to follow up their initial success. After his talk, I found Brian walking down the street with his wife. He gave me this huge hug and he said, you've got to tell people how good this feels. I've been needing it for years. Brian is an amazing talent that continues to touch millions of lives. He faced severe failure and got back up again to rise to new successes. He's even being booked now by corporations to give his failure lab talk around the country. And to me, that's really the crux of what we're exploring. Why do some people fail and quit while some get back up? After talking to hundreds of storytellers around the country, we found that the answer is resilience, perspective, and willingness to change. We wondered before this first event, how are people going to feel after this thing? Um, I think we had an entire meeting just dedicated to what if the audience cries the entire time. <laughs> I literally sent an email to a Kleenex manufacturer and seeing if they would sponsor it for us. <laughs> they did not return that email. <laughs> and I'm off script. This is a terrible idea. <laughs> We wondered if it would be too depressing, too much of a downer, and it was the exact opposite. The lobby was full of people laughing and talking and sharing stories. The venue literally had to kick us out hours later, and that's been a theme at Failure Labs around the country. Some of my favorite tweets from that first night read, I'm not alone. Never give up. People I consider successful suffer as I do. We can be so focused on success sometimes that we forget how it makes struggling individuals feel. And many times we don't get to hear about the valleys people have had to go through before their accolades. Learning of this shared struggle is inspiring to those of us still in the trenches. Since that first event, we've hosted Failure Labs around the country um, and internationally. Our first independent event was in Shandigar, India. We got these pictures back and I had like this emo moment, like, my little baby flew across. We, we seem to have hit a nerve in our global conversation. I think this is because people are tired of the facade. They're tired of the veneers, and they're tired of the isolation our technology sometimes creates. One storyteller in Chicago put it this way, people are comparing their personal blooper reels to their friends' social media highlight reels. I think people are hungry for authenticity and personal interaction again. As we grew, we realized that there was more to our story. We didn't just want to host cool events, we actually wanted to help people change. 
So we developed a curriculum designed to change the conversation around failure within organizations. Using social science, brain science, and storytelling, we work to remove roadblocks to innovation, collaboration, and creative thinking. I had to practice that a couple times. <laughs> Essentially, what's holding your people back? What are they afraid of? Why is your culture stifling trial and error? The curriculum, the curriculum mashes up teams who are usually in silos and gets them discussing the shared anatomy of failure, understanding the brain science behind it. The themes we identify dig into our true relationship with fear, blame, expectations, all of which, when dealt with properly, completely transform a culture. We like to say that we're demystifying the process of innovation. One of our clients is a global manufacturer with plants in Mexico. A consultant was down there, and he found out that they were losing a fortune in scrap metal. The reason was that the team just was throwing it in the trash. They didn't want to report the mistake because they were too afraid of getting fired. Our clients simply couldn't fix what they couldn't see. So we're now working with them to create a culture where people can safely speak up. Everyone is constantly talking about this innovation and collaboration. I am guilty of it, I just said it a minute ago. But what we rarely talk about is what that really means. It means friction and change and fear. The process behind growth is messy and uncomfortable, and it's exactly what's needed to move forward. If I look back on my life, it's really interesting to me that so many of my discoveries and turning points have come out of major failures. I can't tell you how many times, personally, I've truly just wanted to lay down and give up, or how many times as a startup we have royally screwed up. There have been some dark, dark seasons. Our project that we were working on before this one, for four years, never made a dollar, and the premise the premise was positive stories. I thought you were going to laugh at that, but <laughs> I can't, I, I don't know what you guys are going to do. It was a little bit of a pivot. <laughs> Startups are not as glamorous as they're made out to be. They are just this weird marathon of sacrifice and persistence. Everything is uncertain, nothing is guaranteed, and frankly, I think that's just like everything in life. You may even find yourself, as I have, lying alone, awake at night, in bed, just softly weeping. <laughs> it's like the soft weeping that's the saddest, you know? <laughs> if, if Fairy Lab has taught me anything, it's taught me that we just don't grow in comfort. That and that our stories are really important. And it's also important how we share them and how we see ourselves in them. Are we victims? Are we afraid? Are we ashamed? Are we willing to ask for help? It's so wild to me. I talk to storytellers every week from around the country, and we're all dealing with different circumstances, yet we're all wrestling with the same feelings. The cool thing about digging into your story and your struggles and your failures is that you might be able to find ideas and resources in there that can give you a new purpose that, if activated, can completely change your life and your community. I am proud to say that because Fairy Lab has kept getting up, kept taking risks, we've made thousands of dollars for charities around the world. We're played on NPR radio programs. We're in colleges and corporations around the country. We're even played for prisoners in prisons. When I heard that, I was like, what? It's so cool. <laughs> one, one story last year helped change health laws throughout the entire state of Michigan. None of us in here are going to get through this life unscathed. Everyone in here is going to fail. Everyone in here is going to be afraid at some point. That's my daughter crying right now. <laughs> the real question is, how are we going to respond? Thanks for listening to The Loser Guy. <laughs>